right, we're in Luke chapter 2 today. Go ahead and turn there with me. When, there, when you're there, say amen. amen. Stand up then. I, for some reason, that felt like a, a wedding ceremony. I almost wanted to say, now I pronounce you man and wife. I don't, I don't know why. But it's okay. All right, Luke chapter 2, we're in verse 13. And the Bible says this. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, uh, today I want all of us to say it together. Like imagine imagine what it would have been like uh, back in this day. Probably not a whisper, probably probably not a murmur. The angels were probably in very loud declaration. You guys ready for this today? You sure? Because you seem kind of subdued this morning. I'll I'll be honest with you. I got a little ring on my mic. You seem a little subdued. Are you subdued today? Okay. Well, it is peace. You're right. Maybe you're like, I'm at peace. Okay, well, um, say it like you mean it, okay? Verse 14. Ready? One, two, three. Glory to God in the highest and on earth. Peace among those with whom he is pleased. Let's pray. Father, we bless your name, God. You're so good. You're so worthy of praise. And Father, the whole host of angels still could not, in the way that you deserved, fully and completely express your exaltation and adoration towards you in the giving of the most precious gift ever given for time and eternity, Jesus, your Son. Teach us about your peace today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You can have a seat. In the blockbuster thriller, Kung Fu Panda 2, (laughs) the movie begins with a scene, and the scene is set in this uh, really peaceful, obviously it's animation, but it's this really peaceful uh, landscape, beautiful trees and hills, a, 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 a still pond, and Master Shifu. And Master Shifu, Shifu, as you know, is that, that cute little uh, adorable koala that happens to also be the, the, the master instructing his pupils in martial arts. And so their master Shifu is in this amazing setting, and his eyes are closed, and he's repeating... This isn't the first time. If you've seen the first movie too, he's repeating this mantra, inner peace, inner peace, right? He's saying it over and over, over, rhythmically, methodically, like you would think everything was present for him to enter into this state of peace. And then as you're watching the movie, all of a sudden you hear this bumbling, this chaos in the background, all these sounds. And then bursting onto the scene is this massive panda bear whose name is Poe, bringing all of his chaos with him. And it leaves Master Shifu just really frustrated, uh, really upset, because in a moment of time, his peace has been lost. And I think sometimes that's the way that we approach peace. Sometimes, you know, it seems to be so elusive. Sometimes we look to all the wrong things to bring us a sense of peace. You know, maybe for you in this uh, Advent season, you've been thinking with respect to all of the sometimes chaos and craziness of life, can't I just get a moment of peace? And it seems fleeting because there are so many things that interrupt your quote-unquote peace. And to be sure, you know, these are not peaceful times that we live in. The world is in anything but a state of peace. There's restlessness, there's busyness, there are wars that are existing and wars that seem to be on the horizon. We live in a polarized society. Um, We live in violent times, of course. You know, we all were significantly shaken last week with the tragic events that unfolded at UNLV and Our hearts grieve for those families that suffered such great loss and for the the faculty members that lost their life. And um, I want to encourage you to please be praying for the students and the faculty. We have a team that was on campus at the end of last week, a team that will be on campus this week as it's finals week. And um, these things that confront us on a daily basis, you know, they have the They have the potential, possibly, if we're looking to wrong things for our peace, to steal our peace away. If you are looking for a definition of peace, and you know, you 
maybe surf the internet, this is what you'll discover. Many people say that peace is the absence of hostility and violence. They say that peace is a state of inner tranquility and harmony and contentment. Some say peace is how you orient yourself in a world of chaos and order. The question is, if that's the case, and maybe some of those things are true, how do you get to that point? Because the reality is, and I know that you, you know this, just as you survey people around you, and maybe even your own life today, people aren't at a place of peace. I think that the absence of peace has more to do with its misunderstanding than the chaos or uncertainty of life. I want to I want to say this again, and I know sometimes, you know, um, as Christians, we come with our theological framework for peace. We come with the terminology that we're so accustomed to saying, and, and there are things that we can say about peace that we can affirm with our minds, but we're not really experiencing with our lives. And so today's message is not just for the unbeliever. Today's message is for the believer as well. I think that the absence of peace has more to do with its misunderstanding than with the chaos or uncertainty of life. Now, as we read the story, you guys know this was anything but a peaceful time for Joseph and Mary. Um, you think sometimes your life gets disrupted by God? Think about how their life got disrupted by God. I mean, here they were, probably young teenagers, they had uh, been arranged to be married. It was just the way it was, the custom at the time, the culture of the day. Uh, the marriage had been arranged. They were legally contracted to each other. And as they came of age, they were considered to be betrothed. And that means that they were legally bound to each other as husband and wife, but there had not yet been the marriage ceremony, and they had not yet consummated their marriage physically um, in sexual relationship. And so as the story unfolds, and listen, you can imagine like all of that as a young person, here you are, like there's anticipation, there's excitement. You know, evidently they loved each other. There's no doubt about it. There was, there was a joy as God was going to bring to pass what they'd waited so many years for. And it wasn't just them. It was their whole village because back in the day, in, in this time, when someone got married, married, it was a social event. Everyone was involved. And so there was all of this excitement that had been being built up. There was joy. This was a moment of joy. And then all of a sudden, the Bible says that Mary was found with child. Mary, now you guys know, I don't need to like instruct you today and all that means. You don't just get found with child, right? I mean, there's a process there's a process. There are things that happen for someone to be found with child. And Joseph, Joseph, of course, was, uh, the Bible says he was a just man. He loved Mary. Think about moving from a condition of joy and excitement and elation and anticipation to a place where you feel like you've been betrayed, to a, a place where you feel like you've been let down to a place where the most important relationship in your life has been broken from your perspective in the moment. You know, viewing it from his point of view where the whole community of people would have seen him in a, in a different light. Joseph didn't know. Joseph could only assume it was more than an assumption. It was an assertion based on the facts that he knew that Mary had had some type of illicit relationship. And so as he was Thinking through these things, the Bible says, being a just man, really loving Mary, he didn't want to make a public spectacle out of her. And so he quietly figured out how he could divorce her in a way that was most appropriate. And, and while he's wrestling with these things, he is met by an angel. And the angel says what angels always say when they meet a human being, they say, hey, don't be afraid because Joseph was afraid. And then, then there's this unpacking, right? There's this unpacking. There's a, a transformation. There's a massive pivot. There's, a, there's a, a paradigm shift of Joseph's perspective because the angel reveals to him that Mary was not engaged in a, an a, a illicit relationship, that what is in her, she's found with child because the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit has placed within her the hope of Israel, the glory of Israel, the one whom 
Jews had been looking to come for hundreds, if not thousands of years. And while the angel speaking to Joseph, you know the angel's also speaking to Mary. And the, Mary, and the angel tells Mary that she is going to be overshadowed with power from on high and that she is going to conceive by the Holy Spirit a child who will be called the Son of God, the Holy One, Jesus, Emmanuel, that is to say, God with us. And so, yeah, it's an amazing story. And so, right, there's this, there's this chaotic moment. There's the revelation of the angel. Circumstances get crazier around them as there's a Roman census. Rome wants to know how many people are in the empire. And so you've got to go back to the tribe that you're from, to the community that you've been born in. Joseph and Mary travel from Nazareth to Bethlehem. And that route, the most dangerous route to take. It was a turbulent journey for Joseph who was walking and Mary who was on the back of a donkey. You know, um, when I took my wife to the hospital, I didn't pack her up on a donkey. I mean, I'll just tell you right now, that wouldn't have gone over very well. Think about the turbulence of this journey, right? I mean, it wasn't as if, you know, they're, they're driving in a heated car with heated seats, with all the, all the different things that you placed within the, the bag to be prepared for delivering a baby. Like, she saddled up on the back of a donkey and took the most dangerous route. It was a turbulent journey, but peace wasn't found when they arrived at Bethlehem. When they arrived at Bethlehem, it was an unsettling arrival because the city, the, the community, the village was packed with people. There was literally no room left for them. And so you know what they had to resort to. It was impossible to find a place to stay, kind of like finding a room in Las Vegas when F1 is in town. Just <laughs> packed. But peace for them wasn't found in the quiet vibe of the countryside. It, it wasn't found in the safe delivery of a baby. And let me tell you, I'm sure it was a frantic delivery. 25 years ago today, our oldest son, Alec, was born into this world. And yeah, we're happy about it too. And I'll tell you, man, it was a frantic drive to, to the hospital. First of all, I called the doctor, you know, it's maybe one o'clock in the morning and I'm like, hey doc, listen, um, I have measured these contractions and, and you know, this is what, you know, they seem to be and the doctor's like, hey fool, what are you doing still at home? Like get in the car and head down. And so I did, I packed her up and our little Toyota Camry and I went through every single red light on the way to Sunrise Hospital. <laughs> and there was a sense within my heart, there was a sense of uh, not panic, but frantically getting there, getting to the hospital, the doors being locked, pushing, you know, on the button to get someone to come out because my wife is about to deliver our firstborn baby. And, you know, I'm certain that was the case for Joseph as well, without all of the benefits of a, a medical community and the advancements of technology, and yet still there was a safe delivery of this little baby. But listen to me, peace wasn't found in the safe delivery. It wasn't found in the turbulent journey being settled. It wasn't found in finally having a place for them to, to rest and to deliver this baby. Peace was the baby that they held in their arms. You know, I do appreciate this time of year and, and, and for, for many of us, you know, it's, um, there are aspects that are peaceful, right? We've got decorations that are up and there's the there's the hue or the glow of Christmas lights. And, and then, of course, there's the familiarity of family and finding those safe places relationally. And, and then, you know, we, we spend extra time kind of leaning into God and, and having that peaceful moment of devotion with Him in the morning. But let me just remind us, peace ultimately isn't found in family relationships, and peace ultimately isn't in the accoutrements of Advent, whether it's the glow of lights or the beautiful Christmas tree. Peace is found in a person, and his name is Jesus Christ. I think that, and I'm sure you would agree with me, I think that the pursuit of peace is elusive. It's elusive. Um, if that wasn't the case, so many people wouldn't be living in a state of peacelessness. 
Some people look to a place to find their peace. They think, hey, you know what I'll do? I'll just move to a new state. I don't really like my state anyway. It's kind of turbulent. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move to a place. I'm going to build a house. I'm going to have a nice serene lake. It's going to be beautiful when I watch the sunrise and the sunset. You know, you've got your room all set up with, with um, feng shui. You've designed everything to create an environment of peace. You lay your head on the pillow and you've got sounds of ocean waves and white noise. You've got incense burning. I want to tell you today, real peace isn't found in a place. Interestingly enough, the Global Peace Index has ranked the U.S. as 131 out of 162 nations with respect to peace. We are on, we are on the bottom end of peaceful nations. The most peaceful nation is Iceland which probably the case because it's too cold to commit crime there. I'm just guessing. <laughs> and you might be thinking, well, what about the state of Nevada? Nevada ranks 48 out of 50 on the peace index. But I just say this to you to remind you that moving to another state or moving to a different part of the community isn't going to bring peace to your heart. Some people say that peace is a perspective or peace is a mindset I was going uh, through a little research on this, and I landed on a website, um, and the website, the URL is calm.org. And they said if you want to have peace, you need to le learn to live in the present. You need to cultivate a positive mindset. You need to develop love for yourself. You need to practice self-care. You need to visualize a place that's peaceful. You need to learn to breathe effectively. You need to access nature. And I say, hey, look, I mean, all of those things are great until you stub your toe, right? You work hard to get into this place of peaceful meditation, and then you hit your, your thumb with a hammer. Or maybe you're out in nature, and you're like, man, this is my place. This is my place of peace. That's great until you get eaten by a bear. And then I say, and then I say rest in peace to you. <laughs> maybe you think that peace is found in a person. You know, can I just boldly say to you today that there's no human being that can, that can complete what is missing in your life. There is no human being that can complete what is missing in your life. Marriage does not complete you. It does not complete you. There is an idolatry of marriage in our culture today where people say, man, if you could just find that perfect person Right? I mean, that, that whole statement's messed up in the first place. But the idea, is, the idea is that you're just this incomplete piece on your own. And what you need to do is you need to discover that person who's going to complete you, that person who's going to make you whole, that person who's going to give you a, a sense that everything is just the way that it needs to be now that you have that person in your life. Now, listen, this is not a negative statement about marriage, but for those of you who are married, how's that worked out for you? Like, if that's been your framework for marriage, you have put something on your spouse that only God himself can do. There's only one who's powerful enough to complete you. There's only one who's powerful enough to complete you. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. You know, maybe for some people it's pleasure. You think, well, if I could just have this experience and really what's missing in my life are these experiences that the world has to offer. As I was pondering this, I was thinking about the scripture that says there is no peace for the wicked. Um, and that may sound kind of strong today, but the context in which Isaiah says that is the context of idolatry. It's the idea that there's this missing piece in your life, and if you can just pull an experience into your life to fill that void, that somehow you'll be satisfied and happy. And this is the thing, y'all, that's idolatry, because there is a void in your life, and the only one that's capable uh, of filling that void, the only one who is worthy of having that place in your life is God. And... And when you're trying to fill that with something else, it's, it's, it's false worship. Like I said, it's idolatry and it leaves you in a place of emptiness and it builds a sense of, a sense of angst in your life. 
Some people try a place. Some people look to a perspective. Some people say it's a person. Some people say it's pleasure. All of that reminds me of what St. Augustine said when he said, you have formed us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. I want to say that again because it's powerful. You have formed us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they find rest in you. The angels came with a declaration and the declaration was about the peace of God or the shalom. The Hebrew word for peace is shalom. The shalom of God. And the angels, they, they, they preface this amazing statement about peace um, by worship. They say, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace. Glory to God in the highest. Like this is the fullest expression of worship. This is a whole host of angels. Rachel and I were talking about how many angels does it take to make up a host. And we're not necessarily sure, but I will tell you, the skies were filled with angels. The sky itself was filled with an innumerable amount of angels. And there was this extraordinary declaration of adoration and ex exaltation. This is a moment of peace, for sure, as we settle our hearts and reflect on the goodness of God and the giving of His Son. But, but you know there's something that's so exciting about this time? I was listening to Handel's Messiah last night, and um, if you listen to this uh, beautiful orchestration, you know it works from the giving of the promise of God all the way through to the incarnation of Christ. And that journey musically, it works in a crescendo. So it, it builds up over the course of time until when you're at that point where he is shaped this orchestration around this amazing moment of incarnation and birth, it is at its high point. It is an exclamation. It is powerful. It is earth-shaking because that's what this moment was. This moment was the fulfillment of the promise of God given thousands of years earlier there in the Garden of Eden, but also through the prophets Christ, the long-awaited Messiah, the anointed one, the chosen of God, the one through whom God would reverse the curse and bring redemption and reconciliation to all of humanity. The angels were rejoicing in this moment. And can I just tell you right now, man, there is nothing more worthy of us rejoicing over than the giving of the Son of God for the sake of humanity. This was an expression of worship because this was the message, on earth, peace with those with whom he is pleased. Like I said to you, the Hebrew word for peace is shalom. The Greek word for peace is irene, where we get the English name Irene from. But the word shalom means three things. It means wholeness, completeness, and security. The word shalom means wholeness, completeness, and security. The advent of Jesus Christ with respect to peace wasn't just that Jesus brought peace, but that Jesus is peace, that Jesus is shalom. It is the advent of peace in the person of Christ. I was at an assisted living uh, place, uh, you know, maybe like 10 days ago, and we were walking through this assisted living area, um, and I walked by a table that had two puzzles on it, and the puzzles were incomplete. The outside parts of the puzzle were done, but the inside of the puzzle had yet to be complete. And I'll just to be honest with you, like I walked past and I was like, oh my gosh, I wanted to sit down, pull some puzzle pieces out and finish it because its incompleteness created an angst in me. You know, as I was walking by, I was looking at the picture because you know how these puzzles are. When you put all the pieces in place, it produces this beautiful picture. Normally it's beautiful. Like there are no puzzles that I know of that are chaos and destruction and disorder. Normally it's a, a beautiful landscape or something like that. And so I'm walking by and I'm like, yeah, I can kind of make that image out. You know, it looks to me like a beautiful landscape, kind of like a Thomas Kincaid painting. But there are pieces that are missing. And like I said, you know, it's easy to start on the outside of the puzzle because those pieces are easily identifiable because they have a hard edge. But then the closer you get to the inside, it's a little bit more difficult 
a little bit more obscure piece by piece. And so I wanted to sit down, I wanted to finish the puzzle so that there was a wholeness in the picture that was completed and that every piece had found its place. That's what shalom is. Shalom is a wholeness. Shalom is each piece put in its place and producing the picture that God intended it to be. The wholeness is the sum of all the parts coming together. The wholeness is the fullness of the picture, and then not just the fullness of the picture, but you know, when you see the picture, there's an existential reaction or experience that you have when you look at that beautiful landscape. There's something that comes over you. There's something that's at work within you. There's something that's triggered within you as you experience the beauty of the picture. The completeness means that there are no missing pieces. Every piece has found its place. When you put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ, you have shalom with God. You have shalom with God. And shalom with God is a complete and unbroken relationship with him. It means that you're whole. It means that the relationship that had been broken between you and God has been reconciled. Two pieces that were in opposition to one another have been brought together in covenant relationship. The whole picture of God's intention for humanity is now complete in your life. I mean, that's a powerful thing to consider. Everything that God intended humanity to be, when you put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ, he has now done that work in you. It is the full picture. It's covenant relationship. It's reconciliation. It's being redeemed to the Father through faith in the Son. Your life now, you have the capacity to be an image bearer to radiate the goodness and the presence of God in your life. Somebody's got to say amen to that today because that's just just good news. When you put your faith in Christ, you have shalom with God. There's a wholeness. There's also a completeness. That means nothing is missing. That means that there's no part that's unfinished. And we know that there's no part that's unfinished because when Christ died on the cross, one of the last things that he said Uh, In Greek, tetelestai, in English, it is finished. Every single thing that needed to be done to accomplish salvation was done perfectly in the person of Christ. There's not a single thing that is incomplete. That means that as a follower of Christ, you don't have to strive. You don't have to work. It's not your religiosity. It's not your capacities that you bring to the table. It's not you in co-op with God. Jesus did his stuff. Now you're doing your stuff. And the two of you together produce reconciliation or redemption. That's not the case. He did everything that was necessary when he died on the cross for you and for me. We were singing this, Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He's washed us white as snow. So there's wholeness, there's completeness, and now there's security. You have a secure relationship with God. You're a child of God. You've been redeemed. You've been justified. It is just as if you've never sinned. And there's the promise of God in your life that one day you will be glorified You will have a renewed body. You will be in the celestial city that is centered around God and the Lamb, and you will worship Him forever because you belong to Him. So listen, listen, I'm saying to you today that the shalom, the shalom of God first comes when you have shalom with God. You have a relationship with Him. When you have a relationship with him, you then have the shalom of God. The shalom of God is a wholeness, a completeness, and security as a settled state of the Christ follower. In other words, when you're right with God, you will experience the flourishing life. Everything that God has for you will flow from your peace with him. That means as you're in Christ, there's a state of wholeness. You are as God intends you to be. Everything that's necessary for you to experience God is present within you in Christ Jesus. You are at rest 
because you are in him. In Christ, you also are, are in a state of completeness. That means there's nothing missing. There's nothing that needs to be added. You don't have to pursue. You don't have to strive. You don't have to pine for some missing peace in your life because you are complete in him. Every peace is present. And in Christ, you live in a state of of security. You belong to him. This is the way Paul put it, knowing that he was in Christ in Romans chapter 8. And he, grow, he goes through this whole process of thinking about all that God has done, how we're more than conquerors, that if God didn't spare his own son uh, but delivered him, how also would he not with him give us everything that we need? Paul wraps up Romans chapter 8 as he's like laid the foundation of there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus by saying, I am convinced that nothing can separate us from the love of God. Do you live with that confidence today? I am convinced that nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And then he just goes through a list under the, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. There's no principality. There's no power. There's nothing present, nor things to come. Nor things to come. Brothers and sisters, some of us have yielded our shalom with God because of the uncertainty of our future. Some of us are in turmoil. Some of us are frantic. Some of, of us are panicking even as Christians, because we can't control the unknown of our future. And Paul says, listen, you don't have to worry about that if you're in Christ, because nothing separates you from the love of God. Not principality, not power, not things present, not things to come. But you are bound together, permanent relationship with God, who will never separate himself from you. God is not capricious. God doesn't just wake up one day. I know you're like, well, God doesn't wake up. His eyes are always open. Yes, you're right. God doesn't change his mind on any given day. God doesn't look at you and say, well, you know what? You're just not measuring up today, man. How can, after all I've done for you, you stinking little loser, you bum, you know, you're out. That's not the heart of God. God is not capricious in that way. God doesn't change his mind. Listen, the basis of a flourishing life is rooted in shalom with God and the shalom of God. The secular humanist would say, well, it's our mor morality that brings to us a, a well-being. And I would say back to them, your morality can't bring you well-being, but the morality of Christ and his perfect life and his sacrifice on the cross and his resurrection from the dead is a gift that you can receive if you choose to trust in him. You can be I'm taking the long way to say this to you today, but you can be content in Christ. You can live in a you can live in a state of contentment. You can recognize that everything that you've ever needed has been placed within you through faith in Jesus. And God has made you whole, and God has made you complete, and God has secured you to himself. And so you can say, listen, you can say, it doesn't matter what I have or don't have. It doesn't matter if, I, if that relationship happens or it doesn't happen. It doesn't matter if I get the job or I don't get the job. It doesn't matter what's coming down the pike. It doesn't matter what happened in the past. It doesn't matter my circumstances in the present because I have Jesus, and if I have Jesus, I have everything that I need. There's a fullness. There's a fullness. You know, there's a fullness. And, and the atheist and the secular humanist would say, well, you know what? Um, we don't believe that. And you can't get there because of that. And what you believe is false. And the Bible says the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Because no one can take that personal experience that you have had with God away from you. It is yours. It is yours. I say that to say you can give it away. You can give it away even as Christians. Like when we're not leaning into the shalom of God, you know sometimes we can become so frantic, so panicked, so overly concerned that we make stupid decisions in our life because we've not just settled and rested in the fullness of God through the presence of his son in our life. 
You know, I may say all of this to you today, and as a Christian, you might be thinking, hey, that, I get the biblical reality of that, Pastor, but my experience, you know, I mean, I, I come today, even as a Christian, with, with frustration and anxiety and stress. I'm overwhelmed. You know, I'm stretched thin. And, and I would say to you, frustration, anxiety, and stress are warning lights. They're warning lights that lead us back to the shalom of God. God has placed those things within you. I'm not saying today that God is the cause of stress, anxiety, or frustration. But when those things emerge in your life, they are signs that you are not living to God's peace. You're not living to God's peace. God does not want you chronically living in a condition of frustration, anxiety, and stress. And you know, as Christians, even as Christians, sometimes what happens is this is the place we dwell. We, we pitch our tent. We pitch our tent in stress. We pitch our tent in anxiety. We make that our dwelling place. We, we start to think, hey, well, this is just the way that life is. We blame it on the circumstances around us. We blame it on the people that we, were thought, we thought were going to be the answer for us. And God says, I don't want you living there. I've not done all this. I've not created peace with you and given you my peace so that you could pitch your tent in anxiety, stress, and frustration. I don't want you living in that spot. And you say, well, how do I get out? You get out by being a person of faith who trusts in and leans into the peace that God has provided in the giving of his son. And you find the contentment that your heart needs. You find the contentment that your heart needs. If you feel like there's an emptiness in your heart, it's not because you're not getting something the world has to offer. It's because you're not leaning into something God's already given to you. And that, that means that there's got to be a discipline, brothers and sisters. You know, I could sit here, I could sit here and church could be a facade. Oh, we had a video, our video screens messed up, you know. It wasn't the first service. You guys got spared. But, but, you know, there are times where it's like, I'm glad that what we do is flawed. I'm glad that what we do is flawed. I'm glad, I'm glad things don't work sometimes. I'm glad that video screens uh, break. I'm, I'm glad that um, sometimes things don't go off as perfectly as we want them to because the danger is if, if, if it's all perfect here, you're going to start to think that that's the way life is. And as long as we project perfection, that we can contain anything on the inside and hide it from the world, because what, all that matters is that we present the right image. And life is not about presenting the right image. Life is about being honest and authentic and transparent with God and letting God get into the inside. In fact, the most dangerous thing that we can do is present a, an image that we have it all together when we don't. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5.23, just to wrap this part up, he says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. By the way, he is the God of peace. Sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. I want to close today by reminding you, God's shalom came at a high price. It came at a high price. It's a powerful statement the angels make. Glory to God in the highest and on earth. Peace among those with whom he is pleased. Among those with whom he is pleased. Like you have to be compelled today to say, who is God pleased with? And how do you enter into a condition where you know that the pleasure of God rests upon you. I read a quote this week from a former president of Harvard, early 20th century, during the uh, First World War, the Great War. Uh, he was talking about, they, they were in the middle of the war, and how he was talking about how it was important to press through to get peace. Because to come up short after all that had been done would have been failure. And so he starts this writing by saying, is peace a thing for which it is worthwhile to pay a price? 
He says, if not, it must be because the thing that can be obtained without price, either number one, cannot be obtained at all, or number two, is not worth having. And so he's just simply saying, hey, listen, you guys, we have to determine whether peace is worth the price that we need to pay. If the answer is no, then it must be, number one, that it can't be obtained, or number two, that it's not worth having. And when it came to your salvation, this was something that could be obtained and was worth having. And you know that's true because a baby was born in a manger 2,000 years ago, the gift of God from heaven who lived a perfect life for you and for me and who died on the cross, a substitutionary death, a sacrifice for the sin that we had committed, a war that we started with God, and God perceived that peace was worth it and he was willing to pay the ultimate price. And the ultimate price was Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Prince of Shalom, who rose victoriously from the dead on the third day and ascended to the right hand of God. <clears throat> Colossians 1.20 says this, And through Jesus, to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. It was his life for your life. You were worth the price that he was willing to pay. And I want to say to you today, peace isn't something you achieve, it's something you receive because it was already achieved for you.